for those of you who were here last Sunday, you were blessed by Jim's sermon. If you weren't, you can go to YouTube and listen to it again. And today, I'm going to give a different sermon than I did at 9.30, even though there are parts that will be similar. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to speak to our seniors and our graduates. And it's a universal message, but I think it's important that we mark this day as special, as sacred, when we want to name and congratulate our graduates. So if you want to hear the 930 sermon, you can go to YouTube and listen to that. But I want to talk to our graduates about what it means to really be happy. And the reason I want to do that, I'm talking to all of us, but I, I think this is true. And I know it's true in my, my hearing. I hear it often. But I think the number one issue that people are asking today is, what does it take to be happy? So the other day, I was talking to a young man who was graduating from college, and there was a parent nearby and a friend of the parents standing next to that parent. And, and so we were having conversation about life and what are you going to do, you know, all of that. And the friend of the parent said to the guy graduating, well, I don't care what you do, just be happy. Whatever it takes to be happy, just do that. I think our culture is really obsessed right now with being happy. Well, what does it mean to really be genuinely happy? And how do we get there? So I'm going to do a three-point sermon. I don't have a poem. I used to say, they used to say, preach a three-point sermon, a prayer, and a poem. And I don't have, I have a prayer, but not a poem. So forgive me in advance for that. But three points. Here's the first one. If you want to really be happy, then stop comparing and begin contributing. Some of you know I have a fascination with psychology. I studied it. And one of the things I studied is what makes a person happy. And there's a lot of research that proves what I'm about to say. People that are really genuinely happy have discovered to stop comparing and begin contributing, meaning that the degree to which we are happy is the degree to which we are making a difference in other people's lives. But the people who are less happy are people who are always comparing. Well, how's Marvin doing? Is he getting ahead of me in the game of life? Those of you who are my age and older, what did we used to call that? Keeping up with the Joneses. Always comparing. And it is a trap. It is a trap that will only lead to discouragement and despair because my mother, in her wisdom, always said to me growing up, there's always somebody smarter than you and there's somebody that's not as smart as you. There's somebody richer than you and there's somebody poorer than you. Now that's wisdom. Right? So don't play the comparison game. Be your best self. Be your best self in a way that makes a contribution so that people will be blessed. One of my favorite Jewish stories, my, one of my professors in seminary was a Jewish rabbi teaching us the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, and he would say this story often. And I used to wonder why he said it so often. And the older I get, the more I understand why he said it so often. But there's these tales. They're called Hasidic tales, teaching the faith through stories. And this story goes like this, that this man died, goes to heaven, stands before Yahweh, and says, I'm so sorry, Yahweh, that I wasn't more like Moses. 
I'm so sorry that the whole of my life I disappointed you greatly because I wasn't the man that Moses was. And God interrupts and says, stop it. Stop it is a good Hebrew word. It's called Shabbat. Shabbat, the Sabbath. Stop it. It means you stop it. And Yahweh said, I'm just more disappointed that you weren't Joseph. That's who you are. You're Joseph. I didn't make you to be Moses. I made you to be Joseph. You see, the comparison game. Here's the interesting thing. This week I was reading up on my psychology and there's an interesting study that is recent that shows that people who play the comparison game are people who generally are not making as much of a contribution to society. Because they're too preoccupied. How am I doing? How am I comparing? Be your best self. Be the person God created you to be. Stop trying to be somebody you're not. Here's the second point. Are you ready? The second point is, if you want to be genuinely happy, you have to look for the good in people and don't focus on the bad. Jim's met John Wooden. John Wooden was not only a great basketball coach, but a wise man. I'll never forget the interview. Maybe you've heard me share this. I've shared it in a variety of settings where NPR was interviewing him about a few months before he died, National Public Radio, and they said, Coach Wooden, Bobby Knight is a controversial figure. You've been a coach for a long time. What would you say about Bobby Knight? He said... There's good in the worst of us and there's bad in the best of us. Now he's quoting a philosopher, but that's wisdom. So the interviewer said, well, I, I want to push you a little bit. What, what do you really believe about Bobby Knight? I believe there's good in the worst of us. And there's bad in the best of us. Look for the good. The other day, I was driving on K96, and there was a wreck in the right lane, and they had the right lane closed, and which lane was I driving in? The right lane. So what did I want to do? Get over to the left lane. So, to use a Montana term, I turned on my blinker. I notice you don't call it a blinker here. A turn signal is what the Kansas driver's license book says. So I turned on my turn signal, and there was a white pickup truck. I made sure that it wasn't any of you driving before I tell this story. <laughs> and there was a perfect opportunity for this white pickup truck to let me in. It was a she. She did not let me in. Not only did she not let me in, I mean, she closed the gap. She was sending a very strong signal. You are not going to come between me and the car in front of me. And I looked over at her, and she looked over at me, and it was like <laughs> meaner than Moses looking at me. And then she sped away, and her license plate said, 
in God we trust. <laughs> she spent money to have a license plate. That is not a free license plate in Kansas. Are you aware of that? She spent money to say, in God we trust. The teaching from the gospel today is, as I have loved you, love one another. That is really easy when you're loving somebody who loves you. It's another thing to love somebody who acts like a jerk, driving a pickup truck, going like a bat out of Hades with a license plate that says, in God we trust. I'm sorry, Larry? It was her husband's truck. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. But you see, what I shared at 9.30 is that what amazes me about the story of Jesus giving us this new teaching. It was not new to love one another. What was new is that Jesus said, as I have loved you. Here's what we know psychologically about love. We only love to the degree that we know we're loved. We give what we have. We share what we know. People who don't feel loved can't love well. And it begins with receiving the love of God for us. As Jim said in the retreat experience, and he preached it here as well, it's the love that comes down, that is received within, that is shared outwardly. People who struggle with the outward have a problem with what's going on within and that goes back to whether or not we can receive the unconditional love of God for us as revealed in Jesus. But look for the good. And you'll never be disappointed. If you focus on the bad, you'll be disappointed and discouraged every time. We used to have a district superintendent, Gary Brooks, who would come, and every benediction he said this. I found out that it's also on the walls of Jimmy John's, not in the bathroom, but out in the... <laughs> and it's, all, it's one of those, what do we call it, folklore. And it says this. Love like you've never been hurt. Love like you've never been hurt. Jesus is betrayed by Judas and he says, I'm giving you this new teaching. Just as I have loved you, love one another. It's easy to love the Johns. I shouldn't have said that. It's easy to love the, the John, the Apostle John in this. It says, you know, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me and we've got this this love fest going. That's easy. But what do you do when the Judases come along? The degree to which we love is the degree to which we receive love. Here's the final one. I don't say this because I'm a pastor. I say it because I have come to believe it's true. If you want to really be happy, not only stop comparing, but begin contributing. What am I going to do with my life that makes the greatest difference? And then look for the good, not for the bad, but here's a third. Keep Jesus in the center of your life. If Jesus is at the center, then you have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You have received a Christ that will not change. You have received a love that is deeper than what you can imagine. What does it mean to keep Jesus at the center of our lives. 
I want to share with you as I close a prayer. I teach this to the confirmands. It comes from a Catholic nun named Sister Joyce Rupp. She lives in Des Moines. I love this prayer. It's simple. It's comprehensive. It's everything I've tried to say today. It goes like this. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of another day. I reach out in compassion to my sisters and brothers throughout the world. I offer to you all that I am and all that I have. I open myself to receive the gift that you have for me today. I thank you for your creation. Help me today to be lost in wonder, beauty, love, and praise. And may I be united with you throughout this day. Amen.